Hedy Lamar, born Hedwig Eva Maria Kaisler, November 9, 1914 to January 19, 2000, was an Austrian-born American film actress and inventor. After a brief early film career in Czechoslovakia, including the controversial Ecstasy, 1933, she fled from her husband, a wealthy Austrian ammunition manufacturer, and secretly moved to Paris. Traveling to London, she met Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer studio head Louis B. Mayer, who offered her a movie contract in Hollywood. She became a film star with her performance in Algiers 1938. Her MGM films include Lady of the Tropics 1939, Boomtown 1940, H.M. Pullum, ESQ 1941, and White Cargo 1942. Her greatest success was as Delilah in Cecil B. DeMille's Samson and Delilah 1949. She also acted on television before the release of her final film, The Female Animal 1958. She was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960. At the beginning of World War II, she and composer George Anthill developed a radio guidance system for Allied torpedoes that used spread spectrum and frequency hopping technology to defeat the threat of jamming by the Axis powers. Although the U.S. Navy did not adopt the technology until the 1960s, the principles of their work are incorporated into Bluetooth technology and are similar to methods used in legacy versions of CDMA and Wi Fi. This work led to their induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2014. Topic: Early Life. Lamar was born Hedwig Eva Maria Kaisler in 1914 in Vienna, Austria-Hungary, the only child of Gertrude Trude Kaisler, nay 1894 to 1977, and Emil Kaisler, 1880-1935. Her father was born to a Galician Jewish family in Lemberg, now LVIV in Ukraine, and was a successful bank director. Trude, her mother, a pianist and Budapest native, had come from an upper class Hungarian Jewish family. She had converted to Catholicism and was described as a practicing Christian who raised her daughter as a Christian. Lamar helped get her mother out of Austria after it had been absorbed by the Third Reich and to the United States, where Gertrude later became an American citizen. She put Hebrew as her race on her petition for naturalization, which was a term often used in Europe. As a child, Lamar showed an interest in acting and was fascinated by theater and film. At the age of 12, she won a beauty contest in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> European film career <laughs> Early work Lamar was taking acting classes in Vienna when one day, she forged a note from her mother and went to Sasha Film and was able to get herself hired as a script girl. While there, she was able to get a role as an extra in Money on the Street 1930, and then a small speaking part in Storm in a Water Glass 1931. Producer Max Reinhardt then cast her in a play entitled The Weaker Sex, which was performed at the theater in Der Josefstadt. Reinhardt was so impressed with her that he brought her with him back to Berlin, however, she never actually trained with Reinhardt or appeared in any of his Berlin productions. Instead, she met the Russian theater producer Alexis Granovsky, who cast her in his film directorial debut, The Trunks of Mr. O.F., 1931, starring Walter Abel and Peter Lorre. Granovsky soon moved to Paris, but Lamar stayed in Berlin and was given the lead role in No Money Needed, 1932, a comedy directed by Carl Bowies. Lamar then starred in the film which made her internationally famous. Topic: <inaudible> Ecstasy. <inaudible> in early 1933, at age 18, Lamar was given the lead in Gustav Mackety's film Ecstasy, Ecstasy in German, Ecstasy in Czech. She played the neglected young wife of an indifferent older man. The film became both celebrated and notorious for showing Lamar's face in the throes of orgasm as well as close-up and brief nude scenes, a result of her being duped by the director and producer, who used high-power telephoto lenses. Although she was dismayed and now disillusioned about taking other roles, the film gained world recognition after winning an award in Rome. Throughout Europe, it was regarded an artistic work. In America it was considered overly sexual and received negative publicity, especially among women's groups. It was banned there and in Germany. Topic. Withdrawal Lamar played a number of stage roles, including a starring one in Sissy, a play about Empress Elizabeth of Austria produced in Vienna. It won accolades from critics. 
Admirers sent roses to her dressing room and tried to get backstage to meet her. She sent most of them away, including a man who was more insistent, Friedrich Mandel. He became obsessed with getting to know her. Mandel was an Austrian military arms merchant and munitions manufacturer who was reputedly the third richest man in Austria. She fell for his charming and fascinating personality, partly due to his immense financial wealth. Her parents, both of Jewish descent, did not approve, due to Mandel's ties to Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini, and later, German Führer Adolf Hitler, but they could not stop the headstrong Lamar. On August 10, 1933, Lamar married Mandel. She was 18 years old and he was 33. In her autobiography Ecstasy and Me, she described Mandel as an extremely controlling husband who strongly objected to her simulated orgasm scene in Ecstasy and prevented her from pursuing her acting career. She claimed she was kept a virtual prisoner in their castle home, Schloss Schwarzenau. Mandel had close social and business ties to the Italian government, selling munitions to the country, and although like Hedy, his own father was Jewish, had ties to the Nazi regime of Germany, as well. Lamar wrote that the dictators of both countries attended lavish parties at the Mandel home. Lamar accompanied Mandel to business meetings, where he conferred with scientists and other professionals involved in military technology. These conferences were her introduction to the field of applied science and nurtured her latent talent in science. Lamar's marriage to Mandel eventually became unbearable, and she decided to separate herself from both her husband and country. In her autobiography, she wrote that she disguised herself as her maid and fled to Paris, but by other accounts, she persuaded Mandel to let her wear all of her jewelry for a dinner party, then disappeared afterward. She writes about her marriage. I knew very soon that I could never be an actress while I was his wife. He was the absolute monarch in his marriage. I was like a doll. I was like a thing, some object of art which had to be guarded and imprisoned, having no mind, no life of its own. Topic. Hollywood career Topic. Louis B. Mayer and MGM After arriving in London in 1937, she met Louis B. Mayer, head of MGM, who was scouting for talent in Europe. She initially turned down the offer he made her of $125 a week, but then booked herself onto the same New York-bound liner as him, and managed to impress him enough to secure a $500 a week contract. Mayer persuaded her to change her name to Hedy Lamar to distance herself from her real identity, and the ecstasy lady reputation associated with it, choosing the surname in homage to the beautiful silent film star, Barbara Lamar, on the suggestion of his wife, who admired Lamar. He brought her to Hollywood in 1938 and began promoting her as the world's most beautiful woman. Mayer loaned Lamar to producer Walter Wanger, who was making Algiers 1938, an American version of the French film, Pepe Le Mocco 1937. Lamar was cast in the lead opposite Charles Boyer. The film created a national sensation, says Shearer. She was billed as an unknown but well-publicized Austrian actress, which created anticipation in audiences. Mayer hoped she would become another Greta Garbo or Marlene Dietrich. According to one viewer, when her face first appeared on the screen, everyone gasped. Lamar's beauty literally took one's breath away. In future Hollywood films, she was invariably typecast as the archetypal glamorous seductress of exotic origin. Her second American film was to be I Take This Woman, co-starring with Spencer Tracy under the direction of regular Dietrich collaborator, Joseph von Sternberg. Von Sternberg was fired during the shoot, replaced by Frank Borsage. The film was put on hold, and Lamar was put into Lady of the Tropics 1939, where she played a mixed-race seductress in Saigon opposite Robert Taylor. She returned to I Take This Woman, reshot by W. S. Van Dyke. The resulting film was a flop. Far more popular was Boom Town 1940, with Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert and Spencer Tracy. It made $5 million. MGM promptly redeemed Lamar and Gable in Comrade X 1940, a comedy film in the vein of Ninochka 1939, which was another hit. Lamar was teamed with James Stewart in Come Live With Me 1941, playing a Viennese refugee. Stewart was also in Ziegfeld Girl 1941, where Lamar, Judy Garland and Lana Turner played aspiring showgirls, a big success. Lamar was top billed in H. M. Pullum, ESQ, 1941, although the film's protagonist was the title role played by Robert Young. She made a third film with Tracy, Tottier Flat, 1942. It was successful at the box office, as was Crossroads, 1942, with William Powell. 
Lamar played the seductive native girl Tondaleo in White Cargo 1942, top billed over Walter Pigeon. It was a huge hit. White Cargo contains arguably her most memorable film quote, delivered with provocative invitation, I am Tondaleo. I make Tiffin for you? This line typifies many of Lamar's roles, which emphasized her beauty and sensuality while giving her relatively few lines. The lack of acting challenges bored Lamar. She reportedly took up inventing to relieve her boredom. She was reunited with Powell in a comedy The Heavenly Body 1944, then was borrowed by Warner Bros. for The Conspirators 1944. This was an attempt to repeat the success of Casablanca 1943, and RKO borrowed her for a melodrama experiment Perilous 1944. Back at MGM Lamar was teamed with Robert Walker in the romantic comedy Her Highness and the Bellboy 1945, playing a princess who falls in love with a New Yorker. It was very popular, but would be the last film she made under her MGM contract. Her off-screen life and personality during those years was quite different from her screen image. She spent much of her time feeling lonely and homesick. She might swim at her agent's pool, but shunned the beaches and staring crowds. When asked for an autograph, she wondered why anyone would want it. Writer Howard Sharp interviewed her and gave his impression. Hedy has the most incredible personal sophistication. She knows the peculiarly European art of being womanly, she knows what men want in a beautiful woman, what attracts them, and she forces herself to be these things. She has magnetism with warmth, something that neither Dietrich nor Garbo has managed to achieve. Author Richard Rhodes describes her assimilation into American culture. Of all the European émigrés who escaped Nazi Germany and Nazi Austria, she was one of the very few who succeeded in moving to another culture and becoming a full-fledged star herself. There were so very few who could make the transition linguistically or culturally. She really was a resourceful human being I think because of her father's strong influence on her as a child. Topic. Wartime fundraiser Lamar wanted to join the National Inventors Council, but was reportedly told by NIC member Charles F. Kettering and others that she could better help the war effort by using her celebrity status to sell war bonds. She participated in a war bond selling campaign with a sailor named Eddie Rhodes. Rhodes was in the crowd at each Lamar appearance, and she would call him up on stage. She would briefly flirt with him before asking the audience if she should give him a kiss. The crowd would say yes, to which Hedy would reply that she would if enough people bought war bonds. After enough bonds were purchased, she would kiss Rhodes and he would head back into the audience. Then they would head off to the next war bond rally. Topic. Producer After leaving MGM in 1945, Lamar formed a production company with Jack Chertok and made the thriller The Strange Woman 1946. It went over budget and only made minor profits. She and Chertok then made Dishonored Lady 1947, another thriller starring Lamar, which also went over budget, but was not a commercial success. She tried a comedy with Robert Cummings, Let's Live a Little 1948. Topic. Later films Lamar enjoyed her biggest success playing Delilah against Victor Mature as the biblical strongman in Cecil B. DeMille's Samson and Delilah, the highest grossing film of 1949. The film also won two Oscars. Lamar returned to MGM for a film noir with John Hodiak, A Lady Without Passport, 1950, which flopped. More popular were two pictures she made at Paramount, a western with Ray Milland, Copper Canyon 1950, and a Bob Hope spy spoof, My Favorite Spy 1951. Her career went into decline. She went to Italy to play multiple roles in Loves of Three Queens 1954, which she also produced. However she lacked the experience necessary to make a success of such an epic production, and lost millions of dollars when she was unable to secure distribution of the picture. She was Joan of Arc in Irwin Allen's critically panned epic, The Story of Mankind 1957, and did episodes of Zane Grey Theatre, Proud Woman, and Shower of Stars, Cloak and Dagger. Her last film was a thriller The Female Animal 1958. Topic. Inventor Although Lamar had no formal training and was primarily self-taught, she worked in her spare time on various hobbies and inventions, which included an improved traffic stoplight and a tablet that would dissolve in water to create a carbonated drink. 
The beverage was unsuccessful, Lamar herself said it tasted like Alka-Seltzer. Among the few who knew of Lamar's inventiveness was aviation tycoon Howard Hughes. She suggested he change the rather square design of his aeroplanes which she thought looked too slow to a more streamlined shape, based on pictures of the fastest birds and fish she could find. Lamar discussed her relationship with Hughes during an interview, saying that while they dated, he actively supported her tinkering hobbies. He put his team of scientists and engineers at her disposal, saying they would do or make anything she asked for. During World War II, Lamar learned that radio controlled torpedoes, an emerging technology in naval war, could easily be jammed and set off course. She thought of creating a frequency hopping signal that could not be tracked or jammed. She contacted her friend, composer and pianist George Anthiel, to help her develop a device for doing that, and he succeeded by synchronizing a miniaturized player piano mechanism with radio signals. They drafted designs for the frequency hopping system, which they patented. Anthill recalled, We began talking about the war, which, in the late summer of 1940, was looking most extremely black. Hedy said that she did not feel very comfortable, sitting there in Hollywood and making lots of money when things were in such a state. She said that she knew a good deal about munitions and various secret weapons, and that she was thinking seriously of quitting MGM and going to Washington, D.C., to offer her services to the newly established Inventors' Council. Their invention was granted a patent under U.S. Patent 2,292,387 on August 11, 1942, filed using her married name Hedy Caius Lamarki. However, it was technologically difficult to implement, and at that time the U.S. Navy was not receptive to considering inventions coming from outside the military. In 1962, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, an updated version of their design at last appeared on Navy ships. In 1997, Lamar and Anthiel received the Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award and the Bulby Nass Spirit of Achievement Bronze Award, given to individuals whose creative lifetime achievements in the arts, sciences, business, or invention fields have significantly contributed to society. Lamar was featured on the Science Channel and the Discovery Channel. In 2014, Lamar and Anthiel were posthumously inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Topic: <laughs> Later years. Lamar became a naturalized citizen of the United States at age 38 on April 10, 1953. Her autobiography, Ecstasy and Me, was published in 1966, although she said on TV that it was not written by her and much of it was fictional. Lamar later sued the publisher, saying that many details were fabricated by its ghost writer, Leo Guild. Lamar, in turn, was sued by Jean Ringgold, who asserted that the book plagiarized material from an article he had written in 1965 for Screen Facts magazine. In 1966, Lamar was arrested in Los Angeles for shoplifting. The charges were eventually dropped. In 1991, she was arrested on the same charge in Florida, this time for stealing $21.48 worth of laxatives and eye drops. She pleaded no contest to avoid a court appearance, and the charges were dropped in return for her promise to refrain from breaking any laws for a year. The shoplifting charges coincided with a failed attempt to return to the screen. The 1970s were a decade of increasing seclusion for Lamar. She was offered several scripts, television commercials, and stage projects, but none piqued her interest. In 1974, she filed a $10 million lawsuit against Warner Bros., claiming that the running parody of her name, Hedley Lamar, in the Mel Brooks comedy Blazing Saddles infringed her right to privacy. Brooks said he was flattered. The studio settled out of court for an undisclosed nominal sum and an apology to Lamar for almost using her name. Brooks said that Lamar never got the joke. With her eyesight failing, Lamar retreated from public life and settled in Miami Beach, Florida. In 1981, a large Corel drawn image of Lamar won Corel Draw's yearly software suite cover design contest in 1996. For several years, beginning in 1997, it was featured on boxes of the software suite. Lamar sued the company for using her image without her permission. Corel countered that she did not own rights to the image. The parties reached an undisclosed settlement in 1998. For her contribution to the motion picture industry, Lamar has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 6247 Hollywood Boulevard adjacent to Vine Street where the walk is centered. In her later years, Lamar turned to plastic surgery to preserve the looks she was terrified of losing, but the results were disastrous. She had her breasts enlarged, her cheeks raised, her lips made bigger, and much, much more, said her son, Anthony Loder. She had plastic surgery thinking it could revive her looks and her career, but it backfired and distorted her beauty. 
Loder claimed that Lamar was addicted to pills. Lamar became estranged from her other son, James Lamar Loder, when he was 12 years old. Their relationship ended abruptly, and he moved in with another family. They did not speak again for almost 50 years. Lamar left James Loder out of her will, and he sued for control of the $3.3 million estate left by Lamar in 2000. He eventually settled for $50,000. <laughs> Seclusion In the last decades of her life, the telephone became Lamar's only means of communication with the outside world, even with her children and close friends. She often talked up to six or seven hours a day on the phone, but she spent hardly any time with anyone in person in her final years. A documentary, Calling Hedy Lamar, was released in 2004 and featured her children, Anthony Loder and Denise Loder DeLuca. Death. Lamar died in Castleberry, Florida, on January 19, 2000, of heart disease, aged 85. Her son Anthony Loder spread her ashes in Austria's Vienna woods in accordance with her last wishes. Lamar was given an honorary grave in Vienna's Central Cemetery in 2014. Topic: <laughs> Awards. In 1939, Lamar was selected the. Most Promising New Actress", of 1938 in a poll of area voters conducted by Philadelphia record film critic. British moviegoers voted Hedy Lamarr the year's 10th Best Actress, for her performance in Samson and Delilah in 1951. In 1997, Lamarr and George Anthill were jointly honored with the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award and Lamarr also was the first woman to receive the Invention Convention's BULBIE NAS Spirit of Achievement Award, known as the Oscars of Inventing. In 2014, Lamar was posthumously inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for frequency hopping spread spectrum technology. Topic: Marriages and children. Lamar was married and divorced 6 times. Friedrich Mandel, married 1933 to 1937, chairman of the Hertenberger Patronen Fabrik. Jean Markey, married 1939 to 1941, screenwriter and producer. She adopted a child, James Lamar Markey, born January 9, 1939, during her marriage with Markey. He was later adopted by Loder and was thereafter known as James Lamar Loder. Lamar and Markey lived at 2727 Benedict Canyon Drive in Beverly Hills, California during their marriage. John Loder, married 1943 to 1947, actor. Children: Denise Loder, born January 19, 1945, married Larry Colton, a writer and former baseball player, and Anthony Loder, born February 1, 1947, married Roxanne, who worked for illustrator James McMullen. Anthony Loder was featured in the 2004 documentary film Calling Hedy Lamar. Ernest Ted Storfer, married 1951-1952, nightclub owner, restaurateur, and former bandleader. W. Howard Lee, married 1953 to 1960, a Texas oil man, who later married film actress Jean Tierney. Louis J. Boys, married 1963 to 1965, Lamar's divorce lawyer following her sixth and final divorce in 1965. Lamar remained unmarried for the last 35 years of her life. Throughout, she claimed that James Lamar Markey, Loder was biologically unrelated and adopted during her marriage to Jean Markey. However, years later James found documentation that he was the out-of-wedlock son of Lamar and actor John Loder, whom she later married as her third husband. She had two more children with him, Denise born 1945, and Anthony born 1947, during their marriage. Topic. Filmography. Source, Hedy Lamar at the TCM Movie Database. Topic: Radio appearances. Topic: In popular culture. The Mel Brooks 1974 western parody Blazing Saddles features a villain named Hedley Lamar. As a running gag, various characters mistakenly refer to him as Hedy Lamar, prompting him to testily reply, That's Hedley.
In the 1982 off-Broadway musical Little Shop of Horrors and subsequent film adaptation 1986, Audrey II says to Seymour in the song Feed Me that he can get Seymour anything he wants including a date with Hedy Lamarr. In 2008, an off-Broadway play, Frequency Hopping, features the lives of Lamarr and Anthiel. The play was written and staged by Elise Singer, and the script won a prize for Best New Play about science and technology from stage. In 2010, Lamar was selected out of 150 IT people to be featured in a short film launched by the British Computer Society on May 20. Also during 2010, the New York Public Library exhibit 30 Years of Photography at the New York Public Library included a photo of a topless Lamar C. 1930 by Austrian born American photographer Trude Fleischmann. In 2011, the story of Lamar's frequency hopping spread spectrum invention was explored in an episode of the Science Channel show Dark Matters, Twisted But True, a series that explores the darker side of scientific discovery and experimentation, which premiered on September 7. Her work in improving wireless security was part of the premiere episode of the Discovery Channel show How We Invented the World. Also during 2011, Anne Hathaway revealed that she had learned that the original Catwoman was based on Lamar, so she studied all of Lamar's films and incorporated some of her breathing techniques into her portrayal of Catwoman in the 2012 film The Dark Knight Rises. In 2015, on November 9, the 101st anniversary of Lamar's birth, Google paid tribute to Hedy Lamar's work in film and her contributions to scientific advancement with an animated Google. Doodle. In 2016, Lamar was depicted in an off-Broadway play, Hedy. The Life and Inventions of Hedy Lamar, a one-woman show written and performed by Heather Massey. In 2016, the off-Broadway, one-actor show, Stand Still and Look Stupid, The Life Story of Hedy Lamar, starring Emily Ebbets and written by Mike Broemel went into production. Also during 2016, the main villain in Agent Carter, set in late 1940s, Whitney Frost, was a character modeled after Lamar. In 2017, actress Celia Massingham portrayed Lamar on the CW television series Legends of Tomorrow in the sixth episode of the third season, titled Helen Hunt. The episode is set in 1937 Hollywoodland. The episode aired on November 14, 2017. Also during 2017, Bombshell, The Hedy Lamar Story, written and directed by Alexandra Dean and produced by Susan Sarandon, a documentary about Lamar's career as an actress and later as an inventor, premiered at the 2017 Tribeca Film Festival. It was released in theaters on November 24, 2017, and aired on PBS American Masters in May 2018. In 2018, actress Alyssa Sutherland portrayed Lamar on the NBC television series Timeless in the third episode of the second season, titled Hollywoodland. The episode aired March 25, 2018. Topic. See also Inventors' Day List of Austrians Notes <laughs> <laughs>